So Sherry had asked me about, uh, could I come explain why there haven't been so many jellyfish here on the beaches this, uh, this summer? And I thought about that and looked into it a little bit and talked to some of my colleagues. And it turns out that um, the short answer for why there haven't been so many jellyfish and tea forks and so forth in our beaches this summer is something we call interannual variability, which is the usual excuse for not having a really good explanation <laughs> of why something is different this year than the way it was last year. But uh, there are a lot of reasons, a lot of things that affect whether or not we see jellyfish washing up on our beaches and getting in the way of swimmers and so forth, whether they're teen forest milk jellies or lion's mane or um, uh, the uh, moon jellies or any of these, so, or even the salps. And we'll talk about some about all of those today. Uh, and a lot of those factors have to do with the life cycle of the animal, uh, but a lot of them have to do with just the physical environment which way the currents are going, which way the wind is blowing. We can actually have a whole lot of jellyfish offshore and never see them on the beach if the wind and currents aren't conspiring to bring them up in where they intersect with, with us. So it's very difficult to tell in any one year without doing an extensive survey quite a ways out ashore and out into the Gulf Stream and up into the estuaries as to what's actually happened to them, which is why I'm going to give you this cop-out answer that it's a matter of some years there are a lot of jellyfish, and some years there aren't. Uh, so in order to make up for the lack of explanation, uh, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit more generally about them, where they live, where they work, uh, what they do, uh, what kinds of things they are. And the reason I chose the title uh, is because, um, you know, this year they are a phantom. They're not out there. And in other years, uh, maybe they're out there and we don't see them, so they're still sort of a phantom. And even when they're around, they are such uh, sort of uh, delicate, fragile, and almost ephemeral kinds of creatures that sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. So I'd like to talk a little bit about their general biology and what we know about them and touch on uh, some of the issues that have been in the news in the last uh, couple of years about is the world being taken over by jellyfish. And of course, you couldn't prove it by us this summer, certainly. We weren't being taken over by jellyfish. But you see a lot of news about it in other places and other parts of the world where they're shutting down power plants and they're uh, giving people you know, a bad time at the beach and, and so forth. So uh, we'll try to, try to talk about a lot of those things. And my first task is going to be to see if I can make this uh, video work. Here somewhere. No, there it is. Oh, I knew that this would be. All right. Well, never mind. <laughs> so, what do we have uh, when we talk about jellies? Now, I uh, I very often am uh, asked whether it is proper to call them jellyfish, uh, and of course they are not fish. And so there's been this big push that we need to call them jellies or sea jellies or something like that, and that's fine. I mean, I think. Jellies is actually a very good sort of generic term for a lot of animals, types of animals I can talk about, which are jelly-like in nature. And so we tend to call them jellies, or more technically gelatinous zooplankton, but jellies is easier. Uh, but having said that, I frequently find myself calling them jellyfish, and uh, that's okay. Um, just like it's okay to call starfish starfish, even though we know they're not really fish, and they're not really stars. So uh, it's all right. Um, the zoological explanation will, will come along. But what we have on, on Cape Cod in the way of jellyfish are, or jellies are the medusae, the things that, that, uh, that sting, that wash up on the beach, uh, the moon jellies, um, a new one, a new, relatively new one that I'll say more about a little bit later on. It was in the news this summer. Uh, the lion's mane, cyania, and then the tina forest that Cherry mentioned, which are, are fun to play with because they don't sting. Uh, they light up very nicely at night, they're all very luminous. Uh, and then uh, a relatively rarer visitor, uh, but one we've seen off and on the beaches in the Northeast and, and the Cape this summer, uh, the Salps, which I'll say a little bit more about. So these actually represent three completely different zoological groups. So they're not very closely related to each other, even though they uh, superficially look very similar. And, and our usual experience for finding these things is that they look like this. They're, they're, they're washed up on the beach. Can we turn the lights down a little bit? Yeah. Uh, and in this case, we have a, a cyania, a lion's mane. 
uh, jellyfish, which is very common in our waters, uh, and extends all the way up into the Arctic, where they get to be much bigger, on the order of a meter or two in diameter. And, uh, and here we have this occasional visitor to our beach. Uh, these are little salps. And uh, we often get a lot of calls about these because nobody quite knows what they are. Uh, they're afraid to pick them up. They think they're going to sting, and they don't. They're totally harmless. They're like little, little beads uh, with a blue spot in them. So whenever you see these things, um, they are sort of visitors to our shores from a little further offshore. Normally they would live out in the, in the shelf and slope waters and only occasionally would they be brought ashore by currents. And I'll tell you more about them as we go along. Um, so here's the cyania, the uh, lion's mane jellyfish in more or less a more natural pose for it with its tentacles extended. But you get a sense of the fact that the tentacles are quite long and of course this is the, the business end of the jellyfish. This is what it catches its food with by stinging it with its stinging cells and this is what unlucky swimmers uh, may run into. Um, not a fatal encounter, uh, can be unpleasant uh, and some people have a stronger reaction to it than others but generally speaking we do not have any really super dangerous jellyfish in, the, in these waters. Um, the really bad ones live in Australia and uh, there is now beginning to be a few kind of bad ones in the Caribbean but in our waters uh, we have unpleasant encounters, but not uh, life-threatening ones for the most part. The moon jelly, very common, uh, and this has been responsible for an awful lot of uh, jellyfish blooms around the world. One of the things we're seeing with the moon jelly is an extension of its range as the waters get a little bit warmer. And in the last 15 or 20 years, for example, we've seen this show up in places like Boston Harbor, where it never used to occur before just because of warming temperatures. We're also seeing uh, extensive blooms of uh, the uh, moon jelly in uh, other parts of the world, and it is often the one that is implicated in things like clogging up the intakes of power plants and shutting them down. Um, one of the reasons that everybody gets quite excited about the rise of the jellyfish uh, around the world. So, uh, let's see, this is going to be another video, maybe. Well, all right. Sorry, come back later for the videos. Um, <coughs> but jellyfish have been running, or, you know, washing up on the beach uh, for a long time. And if we uh, think about the evolutionary history of these things, these are fossils from the Cambrian period, so this is 600 plus million years ago. And we have uh, fossils which look uh, very much like fairly modern types of, of jellyfish that we would see now. So these are jellyfish that a whole long, many, many years ago settled down, got covered up by sand, fossilized. And here you see evidence that this type of body plan and this type of organism has been part of the uh, ocean environment for most of the history of life, life on Earth, probably. In fact, there is evidence in the pre-Cambrian period, which is going back to you know, getting closer to a million years, that uh, there may have been things similar to this, in appearance anyway, as far back as that. Now, what, you know, what makes a jelly a jelly? Um, by the definition I've always used is these are, these are animals, regardless of their zoological affinity, that are mostly made out of water. So they have bodies that are typically about 95% seawater, which is what makes them jelly-like. Uh, and that means has a number of implications. It means that they're quite large uh, for the amount of actual tissue that they have because so much of it is water. And their metabolic rates, and their, therefore their energy requirements and their food requirements are relatively small compared to the size of the animal. It also means that they are, since they're mostly water, they're neutrally buoyant. So they don't, they can float very easily, they don't sink or, uh, and they don't have to expend a lot of energy in swimming because they don't have to overcome gravity. A lot of them are jet propelled. And uh, if you've seen jellyfish swim, they go on like this. And they're basically, they're, they're expelling water by contracting the body, what we call the bell, the body, and that water as it goes this way, it makes the jellyfish go that way. 
And this kind of jet propulsion we see in a lot of different organisms, not just the typical Medusa type of jellyfish around here, but in, uh, in their relatives called siphonophores, which I'll show you some of, and also these other animals called salps, which we'll talk about. Um, most of them are transparent, and um, that's a good thing to be if you're in the upper water of the ocean because it makes you more or less invisible and hard to see from predators. So they are camouflaged by their transparency. And when we get down into deeper water, actually there's a different type of camouflage uh, strategy, which I'll show you, which is not transparency, but it's adapted to the different environment that they have in the deeper, darker parts of the ocean. And then since they're pretty much, oops, made of jelly, uh, they don't have any hard parts for them. You know, there's no, they don't have bones, they don't have shells, the teeth, and things like that, which means that all of their life activities of catching food and, and moving around and, and avoiding other animals and so forth all have to be accomplished just with soft tissues of one sort or another. And in the case of jellyfish, we know that a lot of that is because they've got these stinging cells that they use to both to catch food and, and in a sense to protect themselves. And another really important factor is that, and that again is a consequence of many of these things, is that they grow fast because they're mostly water after all, and they often have very prolific reproduction. The jellyfish typically, uh, most of the common species have two life stages. So the, what we see as a jellyfish is the, the adult stage, and they actually, believe it or not, they're male and female jellyfish, and they do look slightly different. Uh, and uh, they produce uh, eggs and sperm, and that produces a larva, which settles down on the bottom and attaches to something like a rock or a piling or the underside of your boat and grows into what's called a polyp. And that little polyp is often very small and very hard to see. to the point where the following summer is when we would see them offshore here or on our beaches. So whether or not they appear here in the summer really depends on what happened to the polyp stage back in the previous fall and conditions of water temperature or nutrient or uh, flow rate or all kinds of things could affect that. So that's why it's a little hard to predict in some cases what you're going to see from one year to the next. So what are they? And I think We've, we've touched on a couple of these things, but uh, zoologically speaking, the jellies would include things we call cnidarians. So cnidarians is a group of, of a phylum or a group of animals characterized by having stinging cells. And uh, that includes uh, different kinds of, of medusae, hydromedusae, and skypha medusae, and cuba medusae are all different sort of varieties of what we would commonly call jellyfish. Uh, and siphonophores are a variation on that. Um, the example that you probably know is a Portuguese man of war, which is a, a type of a siphonophore. But there are many, many others that we hardly ever see because they live uh, further out to sea or in deep water. Uh, and they are rather sort of specialized versions of, of a typical jellyfish. Uh, but they're very common. We're just not, not around here. Uh, the tenophores, we, we mentioned the comb jellies. We have typically two or three major kinds here. We have the little sea gooseberries that show up sometimes earlier in the year. It's called Chlorobrachia. And then later on, the ones that we call Nemeopsis, which are a little bit bigger, about like that. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of those. And uh, they uh, are distinct in many, many ways from the true jellyfish. Uh, but the most important one, maybe, is they don't sting. And so you can play with them to your heart's content, and there's no risk to that. Uh, and then there's a group of other organisms which we don't normally think of as being jelly-like. These are things which, uh, again, typically are not near-shore coastal uh, organisms, so we wouldn't see them on the beach. Uh, but they do live in the open ocean and the deep ocean, but there are different types of mollusks 
that are gelatinous, that are, that are snails essentially, and of course some of the cephalopods, some of the squid and octopus, which uh, you might not think of as being jelly-like, but there are open ocean and deep ocean species which are in fact completely transparent and, and just about as jelly-like as, as any other jellyfish. Uh, there are worms that are transparent, jelly-like uh, worms, and then there is these uh, tunicates, and this is where the salps that I mentioned comes in. There's this group here. Uh, the tunicates are, include things called sea squirts, which are again these little lumpish things that grow on rocks and pilings and so forth. They're one of the fastest growing fouling organisms, again, on your boat or on your dock. But there are a type of them which are clear, transparent, jelly-like organisms that swim around freely in the ocean. And uh, they are uh, uh, part of what we would, we would call jellies. So, um, why is it that we're, why are we all interested in this? I've been interested in it for a long time, but in the general public, there's been a lot more interest in the last few years for a lot of reasons. And I think because there have been more of these uh, blooms, uh, population blooms, population explosions that have an impact on fisheries in some cases, uh, either because the jellies eat all the larval fish or they compete with all the food for the larval fish and they have an impact that way. Uh, oftentimes when we have these uh, dead zone events in places like the Gulf of Mexico uh, where uh, nutrient runoff has caused so much of a depletion of oxygen that the fish all die, the jellyfish sometimes because they're less sensitive to those conditions, they can survive in those conditions, they will come in and, and be much more uh, populous then. We also have um, changes that appear in the distribution and probably in the abundance that are probably climate related. As, uh, as climate change affects the oceans generally, we get warmer waters in a lot of places and that can enhance the growth rate and the reproduction of the jellyfish. It can allow species that didn't formerly live there to move into further north, say, the waters which are now warmer and more uh, comfortable for them. Uh, it's an example of the moon jelly that I mentioned, which is now further north. Um, and uh, there are changes in circulation patterns that also will affect the distribution of these, of these animals. There's invasions, so uh, species invasions, and, and there have been some very, very uh, sort of famous jellyfish species invasions over the years. A few years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a big invasion of a, a spotted, a really big spotted Australian jellyfish that nobody had ever seen before. And it, it shut down uh, a lot of fisheries. It, there were so many of them that they clogged the shrimp trawler's uh, nets. Uh, and you could, there were so many you could fly over in an airplane and just see them all over the surface of the water. They were probably introduced via ballast water in ships from further south in, uh, in the Caribbean, perhaps and ultimately have probably been introduced from Australia where they were native. So these jellyfish can be spread around the world. The other really uh, famous example was the introduction of a tinafor, Nemeopsis, the one that we have here in the summer, into the, into the Black Sea and ultimately into the Caspian Sea where it completely decimated the fishery there. And this was something that took place in the 1980s or 90s. Uh, it was a very well documented case of a species invasion where this really sort of innocent looking jellyfish, which, or tinafor rather, which happens to be a voracious predator of all the things that the fish like to eat, completely outcompeted the fish and uh, is destroyed. It was exacerbated a little bit by you know, mismanagement of the Russian trawler industry and the price of fuel and so forth, but the jellyfish were probably the main, or the tinafors rather, were the main culprit there. So, we care about them for those reasons, uh, but then there are these, uh, we're finding applications, and so there are some useful things that are coming out of you know, different kinds of jellyfish. Certainly the, the toxins uh, are of interest, uh, because toxins are powerful compounds, often they're, they're proteins or, or peptides, and many times these can have uh, medical applications if they're properly uh, identified and purified and you find good use for them. Uh, there's a compound called Equorin that comes from a jellyfish whose name is Equoria, and that is uh, a, a uh, fluorescent luminous uh, material. And uh, that is a related thing is this thing called GFP, or green fluorescent protein, also derived from jellyfish. 
And that has many, many applications in medicine where it's used as sort of a, a fluorescent tag or tracer. And uh, it's, uh, it's also been used to do things like make uh, rabbits that glow in the dark. Um, so there's many, many useful applications, as you can see. Um, and another one that you may have seen recently are the, all these ads for this jellyfish protein that's supposed to increase your brain power, something called Prevagen. Okay, so this is a variation on this compound, Eporin, called Apoeporin. It comes from a jellyfish. It is extracted from a jellyfish. And in my looking into this, it, uh, I'm, uh, it, it, it's apparent that this uh, compound has been shown to have some beneficial effect on your brain function as long as it's injected directly into your brain. <laughs> and apparently, taking the pill isn't quite the same thing. So, I was really hoping, you know, this was going to be, but, uh, so uh, the, the jury's still out on just how effective that is, I would say. But another thing I think that we've seen in the recent years is there are a lot more interest in their public aquariums that exhibit jellyfish. We started at the Monterey Aquarium uh, probably 30 years ago in California, and now it's become kind of a standard thing. And it's spilled over to people, you know, you have a little tank of pet jellyfish on your, on your desk at home. They're fun to watch, they're very soothing, very relaxing, just kind of pulse up slowly and sink down. Uh, and, and from the scientific point of view, we've got a number of new ways of working with them, new tools for observation and sampling, um, and uh, as well as new approaches in using molecular methods for phylogeny, population genetics, things that tell us more about the evolution and the relationships and also where they came from and, and different populations, how they're related to each other. So this gives us a lot of information and, and I can give you an example toward the end of the talk about how that's being applied right here on Cape Cod. And then finally I'm going to mention uh, blue water diving, which is the way I did most of my work on jellyfish uh, when I was slightly younger. And uh, it's a really great way to uh, study these animals because it puts a group of divers here out in the middle of the ocean uh, with some, some lines on it, and Terry Rio, uh, you may recognize some of the knots that you tied here on oh, these yes. safety lines. Uh, thank you. That rubber dip it on That's there. right, yeah, you made these. Uh, and uh, so this is a great way to um, uh, get out in the middle of the ocean, look at all these bizarre animals in their natural environment, and bring them back, and put them in a bottle, and bring them back, and study them. So. Something that's very difficult to do all this because the fragility of them is so great that you can't really like tow a net through or anything like that and get back anything that's very recognizable. So if you really want to study what these animals are like, how they move around, what they what they eat, how they interact with each other, and so forth, you need to get out there and you know do it. So it's like bird watching underwater in a way where you get out there into the environment and you watch them in their in their natural habitat. And it's great because there are a lot of things that are possible to see any other way uh, in the ocean and uh, partly because there are uh, very large uh, structures uh, and or they're very fragile and delicate and um, the examples here uh, this one is a, uh, a siphonophore and I'll say more about that but uh, in this case it has all this uh, all these tentacles that hang down in the water and can actually stretch from here to the other side of the room, uh, but it's a, and, and they're there to trap food, to trap prey. Uh, but you know, you have to be on the ocean to actually have this work and, and to see it happening. And there are other things like like this is a chain of these animals called salps that I mentioned, and uh, they can be 20 or 30 feet long, so you're not going to get that, you know, in your aquarium tank. Uh, these are big uh, tinafores or comb jellies, that are sometimes about this big. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that you, you're never going to see unless you're in the water and with them and bring back, at least bring back pictures. So a couple of the species that uh, have been important in uh, coastal jellyfish blooms are, are these two. So here's our friend Cyania again. This is the, the lion's mane jellyfish that we have on the coast here. And this is one called Pelagia. And uh, this is typically found further offshore in our waters here. Uh, they often have little fish that kind of swim around with them. But in the Mediterranean, for example, and in the coast of, uh, of Ireland and in parts of Europe, these form tremendously big uh, swarms. And they completely shut down beaches and, and everything else because they actually 
They sting, uh, you know, unpleasantly enough that you're going to be discouraged from going swimming if there are a lot of them in the water. Uh, pretty much the way it's these, these things. So we have some conspicuous examples of jellies that are the, what you might call the problem, problem children of the, uh, the jelly group. Uh, so here's another one, the Portuguese man of war. And we don't typically see this up here, except every now and then they come riding up on the Gulf Stream and they get blown inshore and we get them coming into Woods Hole or they come up on the beaches on Long Island or even sometimes further north up into Maine. This is, this is one of these things called siphonophores. And the way that it's different from a jellyfish is that it's sort of made out of a bunch of parts or components, each of which is like a jellyfish. This one has a big uh, float. And if you've seen these, you know that they, they float nicely on the surface. They're really quite attractive. And the sail is, enables them to be moved along blown by the wind. But underneath, they've got uh, clusters of tentacles and that extend uh, during the nighttime. Typically, these will extend down about 20 or 30 feet into the water, and that's when they do their fishing. So they've got hundreds and hundreds of these tentacles, stinging tentacles, that do their fishing. Mostly, they're eating uh, juvenile and larval fish. And up here, at the top ends of the tentacles, are multiple little mouths and stomachs. Uh, so when they catch a fish and bring it up, a bunch of these little stomachs will glom onto it, and collectively they will digest the fish. Uh, that is an example of how these are put together out of pieces. They have some pieces that are responsible for feeding and digestion, some pieces are, or we call them polyps, that are responsible for swimming, some responsible for reproduction and so forth. So that's it's all like putting, they're put together out of a kit almost. And, and people sometimes think of them as being a colonial animal. They're not, technically they're not, but they kind of have that uh, quality. Uh, some of the other siphonophores, and I think, again, we're going to have a movie that probably won't work. Uh, yeah, so just imagine. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big, long, uh, filmy thing that's uh, swimming across here with lots of strands of tentacles coming uh, out from it. And that's an example of one of these siphonophores that's made from a unit or a component at the front end that is for propulsion. So it, its job is to swim, and it does that by pulsing and, and, and creating jet propulsion. It pulls this long train behind it of individuals that are uh, specialized for catching food. So they each have a tentacle hanging down from them. And each one of those, when it catches something, it, it brings it up and digests it. And then the food gets shared through the whole thing. Uh, so it's like, you know, you can imagine a train that has the locomotive in the front that's pulling everything and there are all these different cars on the train have different functions. In this case, they're all dining cars, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so that, that, that's a way that these siphonophores are put together in different configurations. And the thing that's interesting about them is that they, uh, they range in size from just a few millimeters, almost too small to see, to deep sea uh, versions which are on the order of more than 100 feet long. So, you should figure, you know, they're longer than a blue whale. Now, they're real thin, so in terms of, you know, weight, they don't really qualify, but they're some of the longest organisms in the, in the sea. So, uh, comb jellies, uh, you know, we have the two kinds that, you, that we see here. Uh, one of the things that you probably have seen about them, if you looked at them in the water or put them in a glass and held them up, they have these really beautiful colors running down the butt length of the body. And uh, this, the reason for this is that uh, they're called comb jellies because they have these structures uh, here called comb rows. And the comb rows are made up of uh, little plates uh, and that are all overlaid on each other. And, uh, the reason that they're what, they're, what they do is they cause the animal to swim because these little plates flutter back and forth like a lot of little uh, paddles or oars. You think of one of those old Roman ships with all the oars coming out the side. Uh, that's kind of what this is like. And the reason, and that's, so that's how the animal swims, by, by uh, the, the paddling of these, these little plates. And that, depending which way they paddle, it can swim forward that way or it can swim that way, backwards. Uh, and they, uh, the reason for the color is that these plates are made up of, of cilia, which uh, so are like very, very fine hairs that are fused together. And that structure creates something called a diffraction effect. 
uh, and it breaks up the light into these prismatic colors when you look at them. So depending on if you shine a bright light, you get these wonderful prismatic colors. And when the animal is moving, of course, they ripple down like, like neon lights. They're very, very beautiful to watch. Now the other thing you'll see in this picture is uh, te these tentacles. So here's, this has two tentacles here. And this one up here has two tentacles. These are two different species. And the tentacles are used for catching the food, just like in a, in a proper jellyfish. Uh, the difference is they don't sting, as I said before, but they are sticky. So they have these special things called glue cells that, on the tentacles. And so they, they, when they contact something, it just sticks to them. And then they can reel in the tentacle and, and eat whatever it is. So that's why they're fun to play with, because you're not going to get stung. And they don't stick to you very well. Um, occasionally, there's a species like this one that is able to eat organisms that are bigger than it is itself. And that's because they're really stretchy. So you think these animals are like a, like a big rubber bag, and it pulls something in, it just opens its mouth, and it completely folds whatever the prey is that it's eating, and then it can spend the next day or two digesting it. Uh, here's our next uh, imaginary video, uh, which I think shows uh, some of these comb jellies that we have on our uh, coast here. Um, and here's the next one. Um, but let's move on to the salps. Uh, tunicates, I said that these are related to those lumpish sea squirts uh, that live on the pilings and the rocks. And these are the, the pelagic or the free swimming ones. And uh, they are also sort of a colonial type of organism. So in this picture, each one of these is a single animal, but it's tightly connected to its neighbor and the next neighbor. And I think, you know, I, I think of these as being like a string of those paper dolls. If you stretch them out, they're all identical. They're all connected together sort of at the edges. And uh, that's a result of their reproductive biology. But it also means that they form a structure which is much bigger than any one individual <laughs> is. Uh, and that has advantages because it's harder than for some fish to attack them because they, they're much bigger than, they're, than they actually are. Uh, and they can cooperate in various ways. So what, you, what you're seeing here in, in this red uh, color is the uh, food. In this case, it's actually some little red uh, beads that represent the food that the animals are collecting by pumping water in through one end of their body, the mouth end here, and, and past a sort of a filter system that traps all the food, in this case, the red particles and then the water goes out the back end. And this is how they move through the water and they collect the food as they go. So they're sort of vacuuming their way through the water and collecting all the food particles and, and eating them uh, as they swim along. It's a very efficient uh, mechanism of uh, what we call filter feeding. And we see other variations of it in some other of these uh, types of tunicates. Uh, these, are, these are the things called salps. And these are another group, whoops, related to them, which are called doliolids. And uh, don't have, there will no be quiz, no quiz after this. <laughs> uh, and so there are multiple ones of these little, little individuals that are all connected together in, uh, in a long uh, chain. And each one of these has the job of collecting food. And it has a different type of filtering uh, system that you see here with these stripes. And so they all collect food, and then they, it, it gets shared because they have a sort of little pipeline running down the middle, and all the food gets distributed to all the rest of the colony. Everybody gets to share and share alike. And at the beginning, at the front end of this, which we don't see in the picture here, there's a big individual one whose job is to pull everybody else through the water. So again, we have this sort of locomotive and train of cars uh, uh, system that we saw in the siphonophores which now works in this other group of organisms which is completely unrelated to them. In fact, these are more closely related to us, the wee vertebrates, than they are to the jellyfish. So there's a lot, a lot of really interesting adaptations in this environment to collecting food in a place where food is rather sparse and doing it with a with minimal expenditure of energy and also having mechanisms, rather complex ones, for reproduction and growth and all the things that these animals need to do. Now, this I think might have a video. 
Well, anyway, in this panel, there's a, a, a little movie of a self swimming through the water. And in this panel, there's a, another little video of a self swimming through the water. Um, so let's uh, just look a little bit beyond um, our coastal waters here for a minute, because it turns out that um, when you get into the deep ocean, so down below a few hundred meters, uh, which is the least explored. This is a uh, this is a jellyfish, uh, but it's it's about this tall and it's about this big around. Uh, it's called uh, Deep Staria Enigmatica. It's got a great name, uh, and uh, it was named actually, actually for it was first discovered by somebody who was diving in a in a submersible uh, back in the late 60s, I think. A sub called the Deep Star, and so got named after it. Uh, and it was enigmatica for obvious reasons. Nobody could figure out what it was or what it did or anything like that. And subsequently, we've actually uh, found a number of these. And they're really interesting. They're big, uh, sort of the jellyfish equivalent of a, of a garbage bag. Uh, they're, uh, they're about the, the same thickness as the wall of a garbage bag. They're about the same size. They have a big opening at the end. And as near as we can tell, they just kind of hang out in the water and they wait for unsuspecting things to sort of swim up inside them. And then, you know, like the garbage bag that has the, the drawstrings on it, they shut down. They shut down the drawstrings here, and they close them out. Here it is getting closed. And trap whatever it was inside. Uh, and then they digest it over a period of who knows how long. But they can be, they can be quite large, and there seem to be a number of different species of them, as you see. And the other really interesting thing that they illustrate is, uh, see this here? Uh, this is a little crustacean. Uh, it's a type of crustacean called an isopod. And uh, you see another one there. And it turns out that every one of these jellyfish has one of these little bugs riding around inside it. Okay? And we don't know quite what they're doing there. And there are a lot of these types of uh, jellyfish that have hitchhiking uh, animals that live on them, typically little crustaceans called isopods or amphipods. And in this case, these deep sea ones have this, uh, this, this isopod, 
Um, they're related to pill bugs. That's a kind of a terrestrial uh, And it lives inside it. And we don't know if it's the brains of the operation or if it's just going along for the ride. But chances are that it's there because it can, it can kind of snatch some of the food away from the jellyfish when it catches something. And it's protected from anything else because it's got a perfect place to live inside there. So this video, I believe, is showing a, uh, a large red jellyfish about this big around, swimming across the screen in this direction. And uh, it's an example, again, of what you uh, typically see in, in the deep water. Now, and the, part of the point of it is that it's red. Uh, and I said before that jellyfish tend to be transparent because that's been camouflaged. When you get down in the deep ocean, there isn't any sunlight. And what light there is, is going to be coming from luminescent animals, bioluminescent animals. A lot of the animals that live there give off light of one sort or another. Typically that light is blue, blue-green in color. And the red is a color that absorbs that light really well. So if you shine that blue-green, suppose you have a blue-green flashlight and you shine it at it, something that's red, it will look black. Uh, so we think that what's happening is that a lot of these animals that are pigmented red do that to absorb that light so that they appear black and dark and therefore don't show up. So it's a, it's a reverse kind of camouflage, you might say. And you see, uh, we'll see a couple of examples of how uh, that can be applied uh, in other animals. So we get down to deep water, the tenophores really explode. The diversity and variety of the tenophores down in the deep ocean is really extraordinary. Up here, on shallow water, you know, there's probably uh, maybe 25, 30 species, and there's probably another 50 or 100 of them down in deep water. There's only a couple hundred species known worldwide, so it's not a very big group, but I think that the greatest diversity, uh, particularly in form and shape and size, is, uh, is down in, deep, in the deep ocean. And um, so these are all examples of them. And uh, the, other, the other point about this is that all of these have been discovered in the last 25 years or so when people were able to go down in a sub submarine or submersible or use a robot vehicle like, uh, like we showed you there and, and see them and collect them. Before that, nobody knew that any of these things existed. Okay? So uh, that's just an example of you know, the type of discovery it's possible when we have those kinds of exploration tools. So some of these are, uh, uh, this was one that, that we discovered in, in the late, when was that, about 1978, I think, uh, off the coast of New York and diving in Alvin. And it's since been found all over the world by other people who also go down in submarines. And, and so it's come. We thought it was really rare and everything, but it turns out it's just common as dirt as long as you go down into deep water. Uh, and then there are things like this one, a really beautiful uh, comb jelly that's about that this tall. Uh, other ones that uh, have, uh, well, here's an example. Um, inside here, this is the stomach area, and it's, it's red, right? And here's one that's all red. Here's another one that's partly red. And, and this one has a stomach area that's red also. So this is where we think that this uh, business about the red absorbing the luminescent light and looking black, we think it's just, this is now working from the inside out because what we think is happening here is that these animals occasionally eat something which is luminous and they take it in their stomach and it's glowing like crazy because it doesn't like being digested. <laughs> and if the light from that was in one of these guys, that are transparent, the whole thing would light up, you know, so I swallow a light bulb if you're a transparent animal. But if you have your stomach lined with this nice red absorbing pigment, it, it, it doesn't get out. And so it doesn't give away where the predator is to some other predator. This is one of the things that we think is, is uh, the true for this deep ocean environment, that um, it's, it's dark all the time, except for when animals produce light. But as soon as they produce light, every other animal knows where they are. So they have to be very judicious in their use of this luminescent. And they might use it to signal their uh, presence to uh, a, 
a, a female of the same species, uh, perhaps, so they communication, so they can find each other. Uh, they might use it to uh, startle a predator, which is sometimes a, if something bumps into them, they sort of make a flash, like a, like putting a flash bulb off in a dark room, and it dazzles uh, the predators so that they can get away. Uh, it might, some animals, not these, but fish, have lights that they can actually use, like little searchlights to look for things. But they all have to be very careful not to use the light in a way that gives away their position to some other potential predator. So it's an interesting balance uh, in, that, in that environment. Um, well, this is a video which is now posing as a still. Uh, but what you would see is, uh, this, is this, this jellyfish here, this little Medusa-like uh, organism, woo. Uh, giving away all my slides. <laughs> one, one more, there we go. Um, would, uh, it's gonna swim across the screen and pretty soon it's gonna transform into a tenophore. Now, it actually was a tenophore to start with, uh, just one that looks like a jellyfish and it's illustrating a different type of morphology. It's so again, it's one of these uh, deep sea species that, uh, that we discovered using our uh, deep diving submersible. So, more effective as a video. Um, but some of these uh, deep sea guys are quite big. So um, a meter, so like so. And the trouble with them being so big can't, is that they are so delicate and fragile that there's no way you can catch it or collect it or do anything except look out the window at it and take a picture of it. Uh, and uh, if you get even close to this with the, uh, the submarine, it just kind of falls apart because it's so fragile. Mm -hmm. But it illustrates something about what you have to do to live and make a living in the deep ocean where there's not a lot of food. And if your strategy for catching food, as this uh, animal strategy is, is to sort of spread yourself out very broadly and wait for something to come along, swim along and kind of blunder into your tissue. These are, these are called lobes. So you've got these lobes spread out. It's like spreading your wings, and you're waiting for something to come bump into the wing. And when it does, you fold it up around it, and you transport that prey item into your mouth. But there's not a lot of prey items down there, so the wider you can spread your wings, the better chance you have of catching something. But you have so little tissue that, and you're basically made out of water, that those wings are really, really super fragile. So you, you know, think of it as a like the wings on that, what was that airplane, the Gossamer Albatross that was all made out of plastic wrap. It's, uh, it's that type of, a, of an approach. So I mentioned uh, before that there are some worms that qualify as jelly-like, and uh, here's a couple of examples. These are worms that are about a foot long, and they're completely transparent. They're not, uh, you know, they're kind of like your uh, clam worms, except they are swimming down around in the deep ocean. And, uh, and here's one that has that same trick with the, uh, the red stomach lining. Uh, oh, here's another one that doesn't. So, you know, it's not a perfect explanation. <laughs> some of them do it, some of them don't do it. We're not quite sure why that is. Uh, other peculiar creatures that we find down there include, uh, this is a variety of sea cucumber. And if you've done any snorkeling or diving in the Caribbean, you know the sea cucumbers that or live down on the bottom and they eat sand and they're kind of lumpish looking. Well, these are the swimming variety. And there are swimming sea cucumbers. They too will eat sand on the bottom, but then uh, they are able to swim. They kind of have this uh, cape-like structure that they can flap and they can swim up into the water. We think that's probably to get away from the sharks that are cruising along the bottom. Uh, here's a couple of other varieties of the swimming sea cucumbers. Uh, they're kind of cute. Um, and so there's all kinds of just really weird stuff that has become very jelly-like uh, because of this advantage of being neutrally buoyant, not requiring a lot of nutrition to keep going because of their low metabolism. And I said that they were jelly-like uh, octopus, which is, here's another, here's one of these. Uh, completely transparent. Oops, went away. Where's the track <laughs> It really went away. I told you it was dark down there. 
Here we go. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, except for except for the you know the suckers on the arms here, uh, and so this could almost be a, a big jellyfish, and yet it's uh, it's an octopus, very uh, distantly related to the jellyfish. I think this is probably another video. Uh, forget what it shows. And I know there are more slides here. I think what we're doing is uh, moving on to another topic. <laughs> okay. Yes, another topic. Um, so let's get back to the surface of the of the ocean here, and this uh, this uh, question about whether the jellyfish are taking over the world, because there's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, in the last few years, and in fact, uh, at the moment, I think there's still an exhibit, an art exhibit, up in Cambridge or Boston, based on uh, this book, uh, which uh, lays out the, the argument that uh, jellyfish indeed are expanding and exploding in populations all over the world, and uh, are, are something we should be concerned about. There's been a lot of studies like this, and uh, I participated in uh, in some of these uh, studies. There's my name right there. Um, and we've been looking at, is this um, a global crisis? Uh, is it a natural variation in what's going on in the, in the uh, ocean? Is it something that is man-made? Is it related to climate change? Is it, you know, what's going on? Uh, and so let's think about what's involved in the creation of these uh, jellyfish blooms. Uh, I said before that uh, they have very uh, good reproductive mechanisms. They can they can reproduce themselves very rapidly. They have different uh, mechanisms of, uh, of budding, for example, uh, which we call asexual reproduction. Uh, jellyfish, some of them are male and female, but some of them are hermaphroditic. They're both male and female. Uh, Tinophores, for example, are typically both male and female in the same animal, so they don't have to find go anywhere very far to find a mate. And uh, that makes it very easy to have a rapid uh, population increases. Uh, they feed on, on phytoplankton or sometimes on, on zooplankton, so these are fairly plentiful food supplies. They have a very efficient mechanism of, of catching their food. They grow rapidly. Often they don't have any competitors uh, sometimes or, or many predators. And they're tolerant to a, a, lot, a wide range of temperature and salinity conditions that other animals might not be. Uh, frequently, these populations are created by currents that, that bring the populations together and sort of concentrate them in certain areas. So that can happen. Also, some of them engage in migration, and they actually actively migrate uh, either up and down uh, during the day and night, or from uh, left and right. Sometimes they aggregate in a way that actively swim into like bays and coves and things. So there's some behavioral component to it. And as I mentioned, there are invasions of species where they move into a place where they have no predators and they just go hog wild and, and reproduce like crazy. Uh, so we don't know yet whether this bloom phenomenon is something that any of these animals could do under the right conditions or only some have the right uh, characteristics to make that possible. Chances are it's only, it's only some of them because we only see this happening in maybe a few dozen species out of, of more than a thousand species of jellyfish of, of worldwide. Uh, so, what, what's bad about it? Well, uh, some of these things are obvious. Uh, it's a nuisance that if they are stinging you, uh, there is interference with fishing. Uh, they do kill off other things that we would like to have, like, like larval fish or the desirable things. There's the problem with power plants. Or uh, desalination plants is another example where they're situated in the coast and you get these things coming in and they, uh, they gum up the works. And then uh, the other problem is that if they all die off and suddenly you've got a real nasty stinking mess out there, uh, which will uh, suck up all the oxygen and kill off a lot of other things. So uh, what, are, what are some uh, 
examples of these kinds of things happening. These two maps show places where there have been frequent blooms in the red areas here in various coastal areas. This is based on data that a working group uh, compiled uh, extending back, uh, in some cases, almost 100 years, uh, putting, pulling together all the information about where these things were occurring. Uh, there are cases in the, in the blue hatching here where uh, troll fisheries of various kinds were affected by large blooms of uh, jellyfishes. Uh, these green stars or desalination plants, uh, typically in the Middle East here, uh, where they were affected by jellyfish. And this is power plants, uh, again, affected by jellyfish coming into the cooling water intakes. Uh, and then the, the lower map has to do with uh, fatalities from jellyfish. And you can see these are uh, mostly in Australia and in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then other what we call newsworthy sting events, which is, I guess somebody gets stung badly enough that it ends up on the six o'clock news, uh, as, as has happened here uh, not, not too long ago. So here's an example of the problem for fishing. This is from the, in Japan, where there's a really big jellyfish called Nomura's jellyfish, which is about this big and this tall. And uh, they, uh, actually they develop in coastal waters in China and then, they, and then they swim across and as they grow and develop into the Sea of Japan, where they, be, so they're a Chinese export and a Japanese import, uh, where they create problems for the Japanese uh, uh, fishing fleet. And in fact, there was at least one instance when a fishing boat pulled up a net so full of these and so heavy that it capsized the boat. Um, now, some people argue that this is because it is uh, fishing pressure and overfishing that has reduced the fish population so much that the jellyfish are moving into the niche, and so there's some poetic justice in tipping over the fishing boat <laughs> by the jellyfish. But it's not clear that that's uh, uh, the real reason. Um, so again, uh, looking at this is a rather messy uh, slide, but this is what ecological data looks like sometimes, and uh, this is looking back to the 1940s for evidence of uh, population fluctuations in jellyfish worldwide. And what uh, this group uh, that I participated in extracted from this was some, uh, some apparent evidence that there's a cyclical nature to this on the order of every 20 years or so. So this is one hypothesis, I will say now, for why we're seeing a lot of jellyfish now around here. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is that you know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket and the ocean is turning into nothing but jellyfish. And you will hear that hypothesis as well. Uh, time will tell which of these is actually true. But the historical uh, record does suggest that there have been cyclical variations in these populations if you look at them on a global scale. This doesn't mean that there won't be significant effects on regional scales, and those may indeed be due to changing water conditions, and those may indeed be climate related. So, I think what we see in the Northeast and the Gulf of Maine and places like that with warming waters and changing currents and the impact on populations of animals like jellyfish as well as fish, as well as cod, for example, and I'm sure you read recent news about how the cod are probably gone as a result of climate change, uh, will, will give us regional variations and we may be seeing more of this. Uh, whether it's a global phenomenon is something that we haven't completely uh, established. So, you might ask, well, with all of this, what are they good for? And so the biologist's answer is that, well, they're part of the natural ocean system, they're part of the diversity, they belong here on Earth just like we do. Uh, and, but there are practical things, too. Uh, they do help to transport uh, carbon, that is, they're part of the carbon cycle in the ocean that moves material from the shallow water to the deep water, some more than others. Uh, they are such ancient animals, I showed you those fossils at the beginning, that. They help us to understand the evolutionary history of life. Uh, people eat them. Not so much here, but you know, if you've been in Japan and China, you probably had jellyfish. Uh, they are a source of uh, some biochemicals, maybe not fixing your brain just yet, but they do have some useful applications in medicine, and people like to go to see them in aquariums, so there's at least a few, a few redeeming features. Uh, just as an example of the carbon transport, this is one of my favorite examples, these animals that I said before are called salps that, that uh, take in a lot of uh, water and, and filter out small particles. One of the things they do with a lot of that is make salp poop. And um, salp poop happens to be a fairly large 
objects, and uh, they sink rapidly through the water. And this is actually a very effective mechanism of transferring effectively carbon dioxide from the atmosphere turned into plant biomass in the upper ocean, eaten by these animals, turned into salt poop, which sinks at a rate of about a thousand meters a day and reaches a deep sea floor and effectively removes carbon from the system. Now this is something that we would love to find a way to do on a large scale in order to help alleviate the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Whether the Salps will be able to do this for us or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but there are a lot of people suggested, can't we train them to uh, eat faster, faster. Um, the jellies do get eaten by other things besides people. Uh, the sunfish, mola mola specializes in eating them. The leatherback turtles specialize in eating them. Uh, a lot of other turtles as well, fish, seabirds. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're not a useless thing in the, in the uh, ocean environment. Um, they're, they're an item of uh, uh, delicacy in, uh, in a lot of cultures. Uh, if, if you've eaten them, you know they don't really taste like much, uh, except whatever kind of sauce you put on them. But they're, they're a nice source of texture. And, uh, and they have uh, this fluorescent protein that I mentioned, is, in addition to the glowing rabbits, so you can make uh, fluorescent ice cream. Um, it hasn't really caught on yet, but it's, uh, it just shows what's possible when you work on jellyfish. So there are a lot of things we still need to learn about them, to be sure. Uh, we don't know that much about the life history. We don't, we're learning more about the distribution patterns, but they are hard to sample because either there's way too many of them or there are way too few of them and you don't have the necessary equipment to really get a good se uh, sense of it. Uh, we're just beginning to understand the population genetics and we're really in the dark about things like this, about behavior. And they're fairly simple animals and yet they do have some complex behaviors and we're just beginning to understand that. People are actually now starting to put tags like they do on, on, sh on sharks or on whales, on jellyfish, believe it or not. And uh, some of my colleagues, both at Hui and out of the West Coast, have been tagging jellyfish and tracking them around. And they're even uh, starting to think about building little robots that will follow the jellyfish. So uh, we're also very interested in how really are they responding to these changes in the ocean environment. So that's, uh, that's a big question for a lot of organisms, but uh, certainly for jellyfish as well. So let's come back to our, our local uh, environment here, um, our local beaches. These are those salps that I mentioned that we were seeing on the beach. But the other thing that's a, an interesting story here now is this jellyfish. And this, uh, you may have seen in a news story uh, earlier this summer, a family that came down and it, they were in Falmouth or Mashby, I think, and they were swimming in shallow water where there's a lot of eelgrass, and they really got stung. Uh, and what they got stung by was this little jellyfish called Donianemus furtans, and, which is something about the size of a dime. And it lives in the eelgrass beds, and it actually clings to the eelgrass. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that it used to exist here uh, back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, around, around the Cape, and it's known from Woods Hole. And it never was a stinging jellyfish. Nobody ever reported getting stung. And then, recently, we started to get reports about it, about it getting stung. And here's just, in, here's a, a picture of its environment. So, this is the eelgrass, of course, with other stuff growing on it. And there's the jellyfish right there. So, you wouldn't see it, really. And, uh, what they do apparently is that at, at night they, they let go of the eelgrass and drift up and then they sink down again with their tentacles out and that's when they do their food catching and feeding. During the day they're just, they're just clinging here. So if you were uh, either swimming or if you were like wading to get your boat or something or clamming or something like that, that's when you might encounter these things. And it turns out now that they really sting badly. They're really, it's a really nasty sting and it's similar to some of the uh, the, the bad types of jellyfish they have in Australia, there's a thing called Urukanji, which is a little uh, nasty, stinging jellyfish. And these have some similar symptoms, not quite as severe. So it's a kind of a mystery as to how come all of a sudden these kind of benign little jellyfish are turned so nasty. And uh, a couple of people at Woods Hole are now starting to investigate this, and they've been, they've been looking at uh, 
the locations uh, where these are found and uh, whether they're the stinging kind or the non-stinging kind. And so this is a, uh, this is a case where we've got uh, the ability to use uh, modern genetic techniques to determine whether these are the same as ones from elsewhere that don't sting, whether these might have been an invasion from somewhere because there are stinging forms that are known from the Pacific in various places. There are some that live on the coast of the Pacific coast of Russia. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, this group that's working on them is trying to figure out these questions about where did they come from or are they the ones that were here all the time and suddenly something has changed about them? They, they have a, a different gene expression that is getting, making them sting. So we have many mysteries still to uh, uh, unravel uh, for these animals. And uh, I think that uh, that's uh, all I will say about them right now. But uh, I think they continue to be a fascinating group uh, to study. They can be problematic uh, for us. Um, but Maybe we'll be problematic for them too uh, if, we, if we're making the changes in the environment that are uh, leading them to respond in the way they are. But thanks, I appreciate your attention and hope you all have questions. Mm -hmm.